Um, monkeys, primates, anthropoids, what do they all have in common? Everything, dummy, they mean the same thing. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I, I couldn't think of an intro. But listen, I'm gonna be Paldea in a hardcore Nuzlocke using only monkeys, which, I mean, yeah, there it is. That's it, that's, that's the idea. Cool. So listen, none of the starters in this game fit the bill. There's a cat, there's a horse dinosaur, and there's a duck, but none of them are monkeys. However, there is a workaround. As soon as I'm allowed to hop on Coridon, I'm able to buy a quick and overpriced ticket overseas. And so I fly to get the cat in search of Professor Jack. But General, dude, why? Because, my child, Jack has something that we need. Before I'm able to speak with Jack, I have to fight Kieran. But see, he actually has a moderately viable team, so... You know, he thumps me into the ground. After getting steamrolled, I head over to a certain tree where stands a very lost looking Jack. And see, at this point, I had to conduct an experiment. I had absolutely no clue if you were tied to one starter that you received from Jack's egg. A lot of people told me different things and I couldn't find any information online about it. So I snagged the first egg, ran around, and when it finally hatched, a piplup was birthed. But General, dude, that's not a monkey. Shut up, I know, shut up. I restarted and tried again, taking another egg from Jack, and lo and behold, a different and slightly more valuable to us Pokemon emerged. You can actually reset for the one that you want. That's nuts. So I promptly nicknamed Chimchar Wallace because I'm a cabbage and didn't look at her gender. So our female Chimchar, Wallace, and I hop on a quick flight back to Paldea to conduct some business. Some monkey business. <laughs> our first trial was the bacon bug lover, Katie. Before coming to the gym, however, I gave Wallace a charcoal to hold and um, rolled an olive. After that, it was time to fight for our first gym badge. And if I'm being entirely honest, I spam clicked Ember until all of Katie's Pokemon died. It didn't take very long, but as soon as we emerged victorious, before I could even take Katie's badge from her, Wallace evolved from a cute little monkey to a bigger, slightly more interesting one. And that's perfect because upon evolution, Chimchar takes on the fighting type, which means that rock types are no longer super effective against us, which is music to my ears because not only is Cloth the first Titan of rock type, but Bombardier, the second and frankly scariest Titan, has some rock moves and an ability that makes them stab. So in summation, not fun. Listen, before I head over to take on Cloth, I want to expand the team a little bit. The army must grow. We can't raise Monferno as an only child. It's not great. I was raised as an only child, which really messed up my sister. So I take my monkey and get on another commercial flight back to Kitakami and near where I collected the egg from Jack, I was able to find an apom. I caught it, named it Isabel, and in realizing that our starter was a female, I finally changed Wallace's name to Morin. Listen, I, I fumbled the bag on that one. She'll forever be Wallace in my heart, but just to kind of, you know, she's called Morin now. After spending way too much money on another return flight, I could press forth to fight Cloth. Giant crab versus a couple of monkeys. Showdown of the century. I lied. All I did was tickle it a few times with Isabel, then low kick, and then some handsome dude came through to fight on my behalf, but I didn't need it. I pretty much ran the exact same tactic, and the crab died without much fuss. So if you were ever wondering if two monkeys and a clam could beat up a crab, they can. Question answered. You can sleep easy now. You're welcome. Arvin proceeds to lure me into a cave and makes a hallucinogenic sandwich that I force feed to my bicycle. Easy peasy, let's move. Next up, we head to Artisan to take on the second gym fight in Brasimilus Archimedington Watting Bridge Hemsworth III, but in this town they just call him Brassius. A top flamethrower to Murren, ahem, <coughs> Wallace, before heading into Shepard some incredibly pixel deficient sunflowers. Regardless, after completing that riveting task, it's time! Turn 1, I terrestrialize to the pure fire type to take on Brassy Boy and pull off a terror boosted charcoal boosted flamethrower, putting a swift end to Brasimilus's petalil. Smoliv comes out and instantly gets char grilled, and finally we catch a glimpse of his ace, Pseudo Widow. The fake tree terrestrializes to the grass type and Morin pulls off a flamethrower, but the sun one doesn't die because of his ability, sturdy. Well, joke's on them because the flamethrower manages to burn. Brassius says something cool, then follows it by doing six points of damage with a trailblaze. Wowie! The tree dies to the residual damage and Murren caused a forest fire. It's like taking candy from a baby. Or I guess in this case, taking olives from an art major. Without hesitation, we find Swing, or whatever monkey's main mode of transport is, over to take on Bombardier, the Storky Bark. Here goes. I lead Murren and Terastalize to the pure fire type, but directly after that, she gets crit by just an obscene wing attack before landing a Will-O-Wisp. I needed a solid way to lower this thing's attack. So I opt to switch over to Isabel and on the switch, we take a pluck. But Lefty's recovery helps just a teensy bit with that. We protect for leftovers recovery, then the next turn, a rock throw does its thing and Apom uses Thunderbolt. Yep, Apom gets Thunderbolt. I'm as lost as you are. Another protect recovers a bit and Bombi's burn does moderate tick. A T-bolt floors the burden, so we enter phase two. Here we go. See, this fight's really strange because you can't heal in between it, bruv. I switch out Monferno to the other slightly worse monkey. The Bombi targets Arvin's side and Arvin's Knackley missed. Oh my, protect next turn means Bombi fails its rock throw and the Knackley nails the burn with quite a decent hit. Then Bombi hits the rock, but it survives and uses rock throw so the birdie's health bar's getting low. Oh no, I know, we to and fro until a T-bolt sends this bro straight down into its grave, you know. And now it rests six feet below. <sighs>
Okay, I'm done. Before continuing, I head off to catch another monkey. Mainly because Giacomo doesn't actually let you fight him unless you have three Pokemon. And that's classist. Whatever. I catch monkey, name it Wallace, but for real this time because it's a guy and I bounce on out. So where's Kevin? Giacomo! Long time no see, my friend. How's it going? Me and this guy used to slay on Garage Band. He leads his Ponyard and I lead Murrin. A flamethrower floors the little guy in one hit, so I guess all that's left is his automobile. The monster truck has Intimidate, which lowers Murrin's attack, which is sort of rough since I taught her Drain Punch just for this. The car uses Swift, but that doesn't do too much and a drain punch does decent damage and recovers Murrin back to full. We get hit with a metal sound and another drain punch lowers the car to almost half. After the spadef drop, a swift from the river room does far more than before and a drain punch doesn't manage to get back a whole lot of health. After a couple of back and forths though, Murrin emerges victorious and we walk away unscathed. Heading forth, it's time to fight an internet personality. See, I'm all for influencing, but not when it substitutes for a personality. This gal filed her teeth, dyed her hair, wears Pokemon as props. She wears a hazmat suit and uses me for clickbait. Regardless, she leaves Watro and Ali Isabel. My idea here is to tickle as much as possible, which I managed to pull off. We got paralyzed in the process, but that's fine because Isabel was never actually the focal point of this fight. I switch over to Murrin, who takes a measly seven points of damage before commencing the real plan, which is to set up swords dances. Watro uses Pluck, which takes away our held cherry berry, leaving us vulnerable to para. But here we get lucky and manage to get all the way set up without getting tased. A single drain punch floors the bird, then Billy Boat comes in, but that thing also goes down to one hit. Luxio comes in, intimidates Murrin, putting her down to plus five instead of plus six, but a drain punch still one shots. Iono finally brings in Miss Magus, her ace. And this thing is a glass cannon, but it is a cannon nonetheless. I know we get outsped, so after they terrestrialize, I opt to use Mac Punch, which doesn't quite one shot. Then they opt for Confusory, which is really scary because the amount of damage that you take from hitting yourself is based off physical stats, and our physical attack is boosted through the roof. I stay in, and through sheer willpower, Morin comes through and puts an end to the battle. We take the badge. Thank God for that. Mel is up next, and she thinks her fire types are enough to scare me. Joke's on her, though. I'm only afraid of one thing. Overly engineered apartment buildings. It's a complex, complex, complex. Get it? Because never mind. She leads a turtle, so I have Isabel use Rain Dance to essentially negate it. After tickling a whole bunch, I switch over to Murren. But gentle, the turtle's a special attacker. Yeah, but see, tickle lowers defense as well as attack, so after switching to Murren and taking a hit, a drain punch doesn't quite kill, I guess. But I mean, oh well, it falls to another one and we replenish back to full health. No harm done. The Starmobile comes in and outspeeds. We take an okayish amount of damage from Blazing Torque. I opt to sit up so Swords dance. Mela tries to trigger my anxiety by screeching at me and Murrin sets up another swords dance. I decide now I should go on the offensive, so after taking 39 points of damage, Murrin uses Drain Punch, dealing a third of the car's health bar and bringing our HP back to essentially where it was before this turn started. I repeated that a couple of times and Murrin emerged victorious. Incredible. Our underused friend-shaped friend Wallace managed to evolve and so to celebrate we chased a noodle, beat it up, chased it again, beat it up again and call it a day. Before pressing to fight Coffington Shrewsbury Collingsworth Hempis Moth, that's what close friends call him. I didn't like the team that I had going into it. Our main threat is Murrin, and she just isn't really a threat here, is she? So listen, this is where things get a little bit controversial. There was a Pokemon that looked at me funny, and when I actually looked at it, I mean, come on. Is Meditate a monkey, or is it an onion? I couldn't figure it out for myself, so I took this matter where any sophisticated debate is settled. Twitter. Hey, please help settle something for me. Is Meditate a monkey, a human, or an onion? Yep. Diet hit on top. Nah, it's clearly one of those cookies that just grew legs. Munyun key. Uh, th thanks, guys. Very helpful. But hear me out. There were enough responses that said monkey that I was willing to tip the scales in Meditate's favor. It's justified. Shut up. I caught the <clears throat> monkey and uh, headed towards the fourth gym. First, I had to chase a chef, battle a guy, and pay for some seaweed, but after all of that, I'm granted access to fight for my badge. Kofu leads Veluza, and controversially, I lead Murren. I start by using will o -Wisp, which halves the Veluza's physical attacks, which are evidently all of his attacks. We take a hit, then switch over to Isabel. Murren's job here is done. On the switch, we take a decent chunk from Aqua Cutter, and then we go for a tickle to lower this thing's attack even farther. Aqua Cutter hits again, but does a smidge less. I opt to start sand attacking, so after a couple of those, it was time to switch again. So I bring in the Bruce, aka Meditate, and manage to dodge an attack on the switch. Lovely. Veluza uses Pluck, which deals a chunk, and the Bruce manages to get Reflect off, so we're in a pretty okay spot-ish. I have the Bruce start to set up with bulk ups. After setting that up a bunch, it was eventually time. With a seriously bulked up humanoid monkey onion, I decide to terrestrialize. Veloza lands a slash, but then a force palm graves the fishy. Since we have lefties on, we get brought back up to almost full HP. Then Wog's trio comes in, outspeeds, lands a water pulse, but doesn't confuse, so we're in the clear, and a force palm does what it needs to. Finally, Coffington Shrewsbury Collingsworth Hempus Moth brings out Crabominable, which I actually manages to outspeed. And it uses a nasty crab hammer. Luckily for us though, it doesn't crit, so we survive. But even through the defense buffs, that was scary, man. A force palm lands, crits, and kills. That 
could have been terrifying. Now, before harassing Atticus, the most notorious fight in this run, in my opinion, the level cap increases to allow for something interesting. You see, my friends, we can evolve Isabel into something out of Animal Crossing. For real though, what the hell is that nose? Anyway, the Snolly Ghost are known as Atticus, and yeah, that is actually a word. Regardless, they lead Skuntank. They opt to try Sucker Punch turn one, but the move fails and we land a sand attack. Then the same thing transpires turn after turn until they literally run out of PP for the move. Skuntank proceeds to land a Toxic, which gets negated by the Petra Berry that Isabel's holding. Then I opt to use Agility a few times, all the while taking tick damage from Toxic. Finally, I baton pass over to Murren, keeping the plus six speed buff. Murren uses Swords Dance a few times, dodging most attacks, but taking a Toxic. However, we prepared for that with another Petra Berry. Eventually, we use Dig, which one-shots. The Rev of Room comes in, and a quad effective Dig one-shots that as well. The Muck comes in, but again, dies to one Dig. Finally, it's time for the Ford F-150. A Dig lands and deals about half the car's damage. Then we take Pipsqueak damage from a Flame Charge and Dig again. The car falls and we walk away with all hands intact. And we have a lot of hands, if you include me and all the monkeys. Now, before I left Lag Tree Thicket, I could actually pick up a little, I don't know, beetle thing? Is it a beetle? I mean, it's definitely not a monkey. Regardless, listen, I caught it and named it Lord Bottom. Be patient! I know it's not a monkey! Yet. In prep for Larith, I went and found myself some chances to punch. And a couple of interesting things occurred. Our teenage fire monkey evolves into Sun Wukong. And Lord Bottom evolves from his current beetle-esque form into, well, a lemur. Which is a monkey, kind of. Meditate might have been a stretch, but this, this is warranted. Okay. Hey, Larith, let's fight. Komala leads and I start the battle off with Wallace. Off the rip, Wallace lands a cross chop that one-shots the tree hugger. The Dunsparce comes in, I terrestrialize with Wallace and opt for a low kick which does a solid amount. The Dunsparce, however, retaliates with a glare, making this a teensy bit more awkward. See, now this thing outspeeds, so a hyper drill does a nuts amount of damage and Wallace gets full powered. Sick. So here the plan hasn't really gone to plan, so I want to take a calculated risk. I'm sure that the Bruce will outspeed, so I switch in, we take a hyper drill, leaving our boy on 10 HP. And then the onion actually does outspeed, and so a force palm takes out da 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 sparse with <laughs> Jesus Christ. A force palm takes out da da sparse with ease. <laughs> Larith stretches off a little and brings in his ace Staraptor. Not only that, but he terrestrializes. After terrestrializing to the pure normal type, they use Aerial Ace, dealing a pretty huge chunk of damage. The thing is, I knew at this point if I had any hope of beating the Staraptor lossless, I'd need to get the Thunder Wave off. So I did, and RNG played into my hand, and Staraptor gets full powered. Ambipom's utility is amazing, but not only that, she gets access to Brick Break, which I use, dealing a lovely chunk of damage. But what I failed to take into account was that Staraptor has Facade. If you didn't know Facade is a move that doubles in power when the Pokemon dealing the move is burned, poisoned, or paralyzed. And uh, I, I think you can tell where I'm going with this. <sighs> a terror boosted Facade connects and takes out Isabel. I, I'm taken aback by my recklessness, to be entirely honest. Regardless of my cabbage rate, I managed to switch over to Murren, who drain punches and exacts a revenge. The Bruce got so angry that he let out a mighty roar and evolved on sight directly after the fight was over. Isabel, you served as well. Thank you so much for helping us get this far. On behalf of all Prime mates everywhere. I salute you. We salute you. R.I.P. Isabel in the comments to pay respects. Now, before heading off to take on Monterne... Monternevera. Monternevera. I have a pressing matter to attend to. You see, Primeape gets access to the move Rage Fist, and to evolve Primeape into Anahalapi, I have to use it 20 times without letting Primeape fall. So that's exactly what we do. Then upon arrival at Monternevera, I... Monternev... <laughs> I've watched the gym leader verbally abuse a child, and then finally, we can fight. See, this fight was made easy by the crowd's chance. I set up Murren, and as it turns out, she gets access to Shadow Claw. So essentially, after setting up with Swords Dance and getting the boost from the crowd, we wipe her entire team without a whole lot of hassle. Terastalized, Punk, Lizard, and all. Lovely stuff. I bounce over to Asado Desert, where resides a Hoover that I frankly decimate with Annie Halapi. Arvin and I head into a cave, eat some sandwiches, and conduct some more business. Before heading to Alfernada, however, I decided it was time to add a new monkey to our arsenal. I snagged Passimian and named him Hamish. What a fantastic Scottish name. I muzzed a little and danced a little and for some reason that was my gym challenge. So now we can fight Tulip, the Gyaldim who tests her makeup products on Pokemon. Why is nobody talking about this? This is front page news people, come on, wake up. Regardless, I lead the battle by bringing out the Bruce and using Reflect since Phoregraph is purely physical. The Giraffstronaut retaliates with a Zen head but which doesn't really do much. So I switch over to Murren but she takes 48 points of damage so realizing 
realizing how much damage she could end up taking, I opt to just use Will-O-Wisp, you know, to have its attack again. After that, I set up with a few swords dances, taking hit after hit until finally I opt to use Slack Off, a move that I hadn't taught Murren up till this point. See, that brings her health back up to 108 HP and stalls the last turn of Reflect as the giraffe misses us in headbutt. I use Slack Off again, mainly to avoid losing Murren to a crit or something. However, that might have not been my greatest play because they get another Reflect Off. Regardless, I terrestrialize Infernape and stall out the Reflect. Finally, I use Fire Punch knowing that the Reflect would wear off and that the giraffe would probably die to this attack plus the burn. Gardevoir comes out but dies to a Fire Punch. Espafra comes out but misses his move and dies to a Fire Punch. Then finally, Tulip brings out Florges, who terrestrializes, then dies to a Fire Punch. That was scrappy, sure, but we walk away without any casualties and that is a win in my books. After trying my hand at skiing, I decided to do some training before taking on the Ice Gem leader, Grusha. However, my cabadry continues and I accidentally managed to overlevel one of my best Pokemon, Wallace. Sure, I know I have a lot of fighting types, but still, that was so avoidable. I head into the Ice Gem, under-equipped, underdressed, and under Grusha's spell. You, my friend, have some gorgeous eyes. I say it every video, Grusha's eyes are absolutely ridiculous. Let's kiss. I mean, fight. Grusha leads Frostmoth and a quad effective Terra Fire Fire Punch sends it to its grave. A bear comes out and I opt to use Will-O-Wisp to half its attack and then Murren dodges an EQ like a girl boss. Because EQ is super effective, I honestly don't think I want to stay in. So I switch over to Medicham and on the switch take a measly 24 hit points from the oncoming hit. We opt for a reflect before the bear misses its icicle crash. Then I swap over back to Murren who dodges another icicle crash. I think this bear needs an eye appointment. I set up a couple of swords dances with Murren before opting to slack off back up to full HP. Beartick lands a crit earthquake which was terrifying before I opt to slack off again. Eventually though, I use fire punch which cleanly knocks the Beartick on its weird bush thing where its genitals are supposed to be. Why did they give Beartick pubes? Regardless, the titan comes out but a single fire punch flows it. Altaria Grusha's ace hits the field and after terrestrializing the pure ice type, Murren uses fire punch again. Uh, that, that's it. The Altaria died. No, let's kiss. With a quick hop, skip and a cart, we will find ourselves at Ortega's door. Now most of my Pokemon are fighting types and in this case because Ortega has fairies, Fighting equals bad. However, remember that beetle that I caught earlier? The one that turned into a monkey? Well, see, that one is a poison type. And in this case, poison equals good. So I lead Lord Bottom and we come out swinging. Get it? We come out swinging with a poison jab. Azu retaliates with an aqua tail that does a lot, but since we outspeed another poison jab the next turn, floors it. Wigglytuff comes in next and I opt to switch over to Infernape. Off the bat, she takes a body slam. Then next turn, we will a wisp. Morin's fire typing renders the fairy moves neutral, so an oncoming player off only does 29 points of damage. I decide to take my opportunity and terrestrialize Murren to set up. We get a couple of swords dances off followed by a slack off which helps out in the old health department since we can't use healing items. Eventually we attack and use a plus six poison jab to floor the Wigglytuff. Yeah, nah, Murren gets access to some crazy stuff. What a Pokemon. Dash Bond comes out, outspeeds with baby doll eyes and falls to a now plus five poison jab. Finally, Ortega sends out the car beneath his feet and we get outsped and hit with a nasty steel roller. Poison jab does more than half in retaliation but things are about to get seriously dicey. The car uses magical torque and confusion uses Murren, meaning if she hits herself with plus 5 attack, she'll for sure perish. But Gyal pulls through and finishes off the battle with a poison jab. At a go, Murren! At a go! With zero hesitation, I sprint to the laggy depths of Castle Royal Lake and beat up the not a dragon Dragon Titan with Grass Knot with the Bruce. We chase it, beat it up again with help from a homie, it regurgitates some sushi and we beat that up as well. Finally, we're able to face our last conquest before pressing to the Elite Four. Eroy. I led this one with the Bruce who off the rip took a pretty hard poison jab. But then we retaliated with a Bruce in headbutt flooring the frog. She brings in an Annie Halapi of her own and so I switch over to Murren. We opt to Will-O-Wisp to half this thing's attack. Then we take a close combat. I set up two swords dances with Murren then use Slack Off to get her to a decent spot health-wise before absolutely obliterating the Ghost Monkey with a 110 base power acrobatics. I'm telling you man, Infernape's learn set is not fair. Regardless, the Pissimian comes in and instantly gets floored. The Lucario comes in and instantly gets floored. The car's up next and last. A high horsepower puts Murren down to 45 HP and we retaliate with an acrobatics that's so very nearly one shots. But since it doesn't, I opt to switch over to Wallace. We take another high horsepower, this time only dealing 39 points of damage. The car uses shift gear and shadow punch ki- Wait, no, that didn't kill? Okay. Uh, we take another hit and another shadow punch to- What? That didn't kill either. Okay, whatever. Finally, another shadow punch does actually kill this thing and we can leave with our dignity and our army intact. Good lord. The end game was vastly approaching and so I want to take on another team member. I decided to catch Vigoroth and evolve him. I called him Argyle. Now, with all the gems and Team Star Cruise out the way, I head over to the Elite Four and prepare to take on Rika. So here we go. The first battle begins with a face-off between an Annihilate and a Whiskash. We hit the ground running. Get it? Because we hit the 
Ground? No. Okay. We use a quad effective seed bomb and Rika's lead falls quicker than you can subscribe to the Gentle Dude YouTube channel. Rika brings out a camo and I terrestrialize Wallace for maximum damage output. A cross chop lands and crits wiping out the camera. Then Don Van comes in, takes a seed bomb, retaliates with an earthquake and dies to one more. Doug Trio's next and they whip up a sandstorm before falling swiftly to one more seed bomb. Claude is up. And Rika terrestrializes to the pure ground type, then protects. Pointless. A seed bomb the following turn deals more than half of the Claude Sire's HP. Then we dodge a toxic, ensuring the win this turn unless Claude uses prote- Okay, yep, nope, that's- yep. Finally, we land another seed bomb and we take the dub. Bobby! Let's dance. I lead the Bruce and she leads a copper elephant. Turn one, I click reflect and they set up stones. I switch over to Murren who takes stones chip on the switch, then a heavy slam leaves us at 157 points of health. Murren lands a will-o'-wisp, then takes a high horsepower that honestly doesn't do much at all. I see this is my opportunity to set Murren up for the sweep and so I set up swords dances, periodically clicking slack off to regain HP. Eventually though, I opt for the fire punch which knocks the copper Raja clean on its ass. Corviknight comes in, but Murren deals with that pronto with a terror boosted plus six attack charcoal boosted fire punch. Good lord. Bronzone comes in, then goes straight back out. Then Magnazone comes in and survives because of his ability sturdy. Magnazone uses its one alive turn to light screen, which is dumb because punching is physical. So we take down the magnet, then Poppy brings in our ace, Tinkaton. They terrestrialize, but it's not enough. Murren absolutely decimates the girl boss for the win. We take the battle comfortably. Lorenzo! Larry brings out his banana tree, and I bring out Argyle. We use a rock tomb dealing about 50%, then they use Sunny Day to activate Chlorophyll. True on means that Argyle's only 50% useful, so this turn we're just waiting for Argyle to loaf. We tank a solar beam, then leftovers help us out a smidge. Rock tomb KOs the Tropius, and then that baits the Staraptor. On the switch in, Argyle's loafing again, so they're free to get off a close combat that puts Argyle at 134 HP. But it also lowers Staraptor's defense and special defense. A rock tomb deals just over half and lowers a Staraptor's speed, but they retaliate with another close combat, putting Argyle down to a dangerous 36 HP. So I opt to switch over to Hamish, who tanks a close combat, then outspeeds and KOs with a rock slide. Altaria comes in and rock slide deals a lot. A moon blast from Altaria hurts, but we're okay. Another rock slide kills, so Oracorio can come in. We dodge a teeter dance and rock slide nearly one shots, then Hamish dodges another and kills with a rock slide. We take those. Finally, Larith brings in his ace, Flamigo. At this point, I was willing to stay in for the clean switch. I don't love the idea of anyone taking a brave bird. But out of nowhere, Flamigo misses. A rock slide deals over half of its health. The Flamigo brave birds and lands this time, but my boy Hamish survives on one HP out of loyalty. Another rock slide kills and somehow we come out of that unscathed. I mean, listen, it's cheap, but I'll take it. Seven days a week, I'll take it. Finally, we're up against the last elite four member, Hassel. I lead Argyle against Hassel's Noivern and off the rip we get out sped and take a super fang, bringing Argyle down to 150. A rock tomb puts Noivern in a killing range, but next turn Argyle loafs again, which is what it is, I guess. We actually manage to dodge, which is interesting. H how do you miss a Pokemon that's literally been described as actively loafing? How does one loaf and be elusive at the same time? It's a paradox. Anyway, we kill the Noivern, so that's cool. Dragalgi comes out and I switch over to the Bruce. Sludge Bomb deals nearly half and lands the poison. However, the next turn, a single Zen headbutt KOs. Flapple's in next, and so I switch over to Murren, who on the switch dodges a Dragon Rush. I opt to Willow Wisp, then they land a Dragon Rush, putting Murren down to 175. We do the thing and set up Swords Dance again, periodically using Slack Off to regain. Eventually, it's that time again. You see a Fire Punch kills has become a trend, but then Hats comes in to avenge his friend, and in the end, it dies to the same damn thing. Hey, look, Hazel brings in his ace to take the place of all the Pokemon we've faced in this. This is kind of hard to say. Mistakes were made. A Fire Punch doesn't slay his ace. CS got an ability, Thermal Exchange, and this attack goes way hey up. So when Hassel retaliates, it devastates, and yeah, I win, but look at me, our starter's graved, our poor dead primate has to pay from my mistakes. I'm sorry, that didn't go to plan. Murren, rest easy. Say hello to Isabel for me. So let's see this one out. Gita, one of your minions killed my Wukong, and I don't appreciate that. I lead Argyle, and she leads Espathra. Turn one, I opt for a throat chop, leaving Espathra at merely a sliver of health. We take a Lumina Crash, but it harshly lowers Argyle's spadef. So the next turn, as per usual, Argyle does a spot of loafing, and a Lumina Crash puts Argyle down to 74, and harshly lowers spadef again. Finally, another throat chop does the trick, and the emu falls. Gita brings out a coffee table and so I switch over to Wallace the Annihilator. I don't know what happened there. Anyway, I switched over to Annihilate knowing that Avalog would opt for body press making it a clean switch. I opted to rastalize Wallace and a single terror boosted low kick floors Gita's mon. So she brings in a goat. However, Wallace's cross chop doesn't only land, it crits. Killing the go go in one single hit. King Gambit is up next and one simple quad effective low kick obliterates it. Veluza comes in next, we outspeed land an insane seed bomb but it just misses out on the kill. And see, unfortunately for us, Vuvuzela knows Psycho Cut, which hits Wallace hard.
Murder. A Shadow Punch the following turn fillets the fish, and so Gita's left with but one Pokemon. Her Glamora. The alien rock flower comes in and terrestrializes, but we outspeed and a cross chop lands, flooring it in one single hit. Now that we're Paldean champions, there is but one thing left in sight. One fight I need to take care of before I can comfortably retire. Before heading to said fight, I conduct a little business with Arvin, Clavel, Penny, and Nimona. Trivial stuff. AI Turo. This is it. Only two of us remain and there's no turning back. We face an Iron Moth off the rip and an Air Slash deals a pretty huge amount of damage to our lead, the Bruce. A Zen Headbutt, however, Okos. Bundle hits the field and I opt to switch over to Argyle. The Iron Penguin uses Snowscape so this might be a teensy bit harder to kill. The next turn, Bundle uses Freeze Drive which doesn't hurt as much as I expected it to. Argyle then retaliates with a Rock Tomb dealing a bit of damage and lowering Bundle's speed. The next turn, we do some loafing and Bundle attempts to Snowscape. Even though the snow's already active, I'm as lost as you are but hey, I'll take it. A Rock Tomb puts Bundle down to a killing range and another Freeze Dry hits Argyle. We loaf again, they try to Snowscape again and the snow stops. It's too little too late, my friend. You see, because of the speed drops, Argyle outspeeds now and lands a Rock Tomb and the Penguin falls. Hans is up next and I switch over to Wallace. On the switch, Hans opted to Fake Out which doesn't affect the Ghost Monkey. So then Stomping Tantrum does okay damage, then they retaliate with a Thunder Punch dealing about the same back to us. The very same thing transpires again the next turn and after that, a Stomping Tantrum KOs. Turo brings in Jugulus and I opt to switch over to Lord Bottom. On the switch, we take a hit. Then I opt to Terastalize. A Poison Jab does less than half, but because of the Poison Touch ability, we land the Poison. Then we take a Dark Pulse, which brings Lord Bottom down to a dangerous amount of HP. See, I knew here that I had to stay in and try for a Poison Jab kill. So that's just what I do. Praying that the last hit was a low roll, I Poison Jab, and Lord Bottom pulls through. Thriving, surviving, aliving. Thorns is up, and I switch over to Hamish. On the switch, we take an EQ. A Rock Smash the next turn deals about a third to this thing, and Hamish takes a Thunder Punch, but we're all good. A Rock Smash deals another third, then we take another Thunder Punch. But since we still haven't been parried, we outspeed the next turn and a Rock Smash kills. Valiant comes out and I need a clean switch. Hamish looks back at me, sheds a tear, nods a nod of appreciation and sacrifices himself to a spirit break. Then I brought out our terrestrialized Lord Bottom who lands a devastating poison jab that floors the Valiant. We take the battle and the region. Our monkeys really did a thing and I know Murren, Isabel and Hamish would be proud. Listen, if you enjoyed the journey, feel free to subscribe or click one of these other videos. They're a lot of fun. I promise you'll enjoy them as well. Okay, thanks. Bye.